Well, hello everyone, and welcome back to Adrian's Digital Basement. This is part two in my German Commodore series. If you haven't seen part one, I recommend you watch that first because this is a continuation of that part. In part one, I unboxed all of the Commodore stuff that Alex sent me all the way from Germany, and I worked on and fixed the Commodore 64. Next up, we're looking at the C128 and the floppy drive. Let's get right to it. Next up is the mighty C128. It's interesting, the keys are unevenly yellowed with things like enter and restore being pretty much original color and a bunch of the other keys being more yellowed. All the numeric keys are even. I and T, these numbers are lighter. I wonder what accounts for that. Maybe these keys were made at slightly different times, thrown into big bins full of the letters. And then when someone assembled them, they just grabbed random keys and you end up with this sort of splotchy effect now after time has passed. So for powering this, this black cable goes to my homemade C64 power supply, which sits right here on my bench. It's a 3D printed case and it has a, a two amp or is it a three amp five volt power supply in here and a one amp nine volt AC power supply, IEC input here with a power on off switch. So I can control that and a fuse as well. And that comes out of this cable. Now it's the C64 DIN which won't work on this, not unless I switch to the power connector, which I've done on one of my own 128s way back in the day. Well, since that point, I now have a pigtail. This has the female version of the DIN connector that's on the 64. So I can join this together like that. And now we have the square DIN connector. That is what goes into the 128. Since this machine has never been opened, I can see all the RF shields through the vent there, has the sticker on there. So I'm assuming on the inside, this is in great condition. So I'm not gonna bother opening this up first. I'm just gonna power it on and see if it works. And honestly, I expect this thing to work perfectly. C128s are pretty darn reliable. Here we go. Oh, wow, a black screen on a 128. That's interesting. I'm hitting the reset button. Nothing is changing. How shocking. All right, I'm gonna try holding down the Commodore button, which should boot into 64 mode, right? Turn this on. Okay, well, we have a lot of garbage there. This would be a non-working 128. Fascinating. So we're gonna to have to open this thing up. Take a look, let me hit the reset button on the side. Ooh, we're getting all sorts of different things happening here. At least the colors look right. All right, here's something interesting. We have what looks like text that's trying to appear. Now when I type, I don't get anything, but this almost would be the banner showing how much free RAM and stuff there is. Let me hit the reset button again. I hear, no I hear noise on the speaker that's through the SID chip. Oh, that's weird. Look at this thing that's going on. So um, I'm gonna turn it off here. Let me try this diagnostic cartridge. I have the C128 Diags on here. I'm not positive what that means exactly. I should never tested this. Let's turn that on. Oh, gotta push the button on the monitor to make it wake up because it's in PAL mode. Uh, okay, well, I, that's actually not the diagnostics. This is a pitfall, but it seems to be mostly working, which would imply to me that one of the problems might be the character ROM has gone bad because notice all the graphics looks fine, but the text doesn't. So that might imply that the character ROM is bad. Oh, there's Activision coming by. Interesting. Well, I hooked up a joystick and let's see if I could start the game. F1. So this does appear to be working. <laughs> the game is playing. So here I'm trying to run the C64 version of the diagnostics ROM. And yeah, it's definitely having an issue again with the characters, but we do see the color red right here, which was definitely correct for this ROM. Well, this means the diagnostics are running. <laughs> the patterns are hilarious. Not to mention there are these weird kind of patterns in the border here, but that just could be a side effect of whatever's causing this. So at least this machine is mostly executing and now we have to figure out 
what the problem is. So I think there's one more test to do with this machine is plug in this 1084 monitor to the 80 column output port. This is TTL RGB or like CGA and see if it comes up. It seemingly does nothing. Oh, I did get a flash when I turn off the computer though. So whatever's going on is affecting that as well. I think at this point, it's time to take this thing apart so I can take a look inside. And there we have it. I've removed the case, I removed the RF shield, and I removed the thermal compound that was between the RF shield and the chips that acts as a little bit of heat sinking. Unfortunately, I had to break through the warranty void sticker to open this thing, but it was something that had to happen. Right off the bat, I noticed a couple things. There's a different character ROM here. It's a larger EEPROM installed on a little circuit board, and there's a little bit of a bodge wire here. There's also this brown wire that runs around from here to here. Now this red wire you see here is standard. All C128s that I've ever seen have this on there. But this brown one is not normal. Otherwise, everything is pretty standard here. This uses a 6581 SID chip, just like all the other flat 128s that I've seen. I think I've read somewhere that some 128s use the later 8550, I think it is, SID chips, the ones from the 64C that only run on five volts, or is it nine volts and five volts? I, I can't quite remember. This one runs on 12 volts and on five volts. It's fully compatible with the C64 bread bin machines. So here's a side view of this character ROM. And yes, this was actually like this when I took the board apart, when I took it out and look, it's just supposed to be plugged into this socket here and it was half out. This being out of the socket like that could totally explain what was going on with the garbage on screen. So I'm gonna reconnect this <laughs> and put it back in the socket properly and then we're gonna power this thing up and see if it's now working. The RF shield had one of its prongs that was pushing onto this, you know, and you can see a little line there that came from it. So I have a feeling that over time and maybe during shipping, the fact it was pushing down kind of more on, on one side of this popped it up that way. All right, let me have a hairy bow for good luck here. There we go. Power is plugged in. Video is plugged in. Uh, let's power this on. Oh, look at that. It's working. That was totally the problem. Wow. Now, one thing is, is the video output quality is pretty cruddy. It's all fringy on the edges. I'm wondering if that's my retro tank here. Let me change the mode on this thing. Okay, I've switched over to uh, Chroma Luma and it's definitely a little better, still not great, but the C120 always had pretty poor video output. I gotta say it's kind of dim looking as well, but this this could totally be my retro tank just not converting PAL properly. It, it's never done a good job, this first generation retro tank. Oh, look at this color problem, ugh. All right, so C64 Diagnostics. Um, I don't like this particular one. Let's. Switch back to the regular one here. These bands in the, the PAL version of the C128 don't look great. Now, I don't know if there's a problem with this machine or this is just normal on all of them, especially when hooked up to an HDMI monitor like this. So if you know that this is normal or abnormal, definitely let me know in the comment section. Um, I'm gonna see what I can do to try to improve this though. Oh, and it looks terrible in 64 mode. There's just so many horrible looking patterns in the video signal. I have seen this on other 128s that I've had, NTSC ones. It looked really bad in these modes. And I think what's happening is the VIC-2 chip is failing internally because I would find on those machines, if I swapped it with a different VIC-2, it would work a lot better. Things look absolutely great on this motherboard. I don't see any corrosion, but it's weird. I have really found this exact issue with the video looking terrible on lots of 128 flats. If you have run into this issue and you know a good solid fix for it, let me know. I'm gonna try deoxid and a toothbrush in this socket and on this uh, the legs of this IC, see if that helps. All right, will this make any difference at all? Let's find out. Wake the damn monitor up. Look how bad this looks. It's, if anything, it's worse than it was, although maybe just turn this off and on, maybe that Maybe it changes each time you power it on. Oh, it's actually a little bit less bad, but it has this sort of ghosting. You see there's a darker area here. Also just noticed something, uh, 30,719 bytes free. Isn't that less than normal? Isn't it 38,000 something on a 64? 
Although I just realized that maybe this has something to do with the cartridge that I have installed in here, and that's why it's doing that. Well, I've been fiddling around with the VIC-2 chip, taking it kind of a little bit in and out of the socket just to see if it was a bad contact in the socket, and absolutely not. This problem with the pattern here happens no matter what I do with this chip in this socket. So it's definitely not the VIC-2 chip. So just to show you that the problem is not with my power supply setup, I'm gonna take another 128 here and plug this into the exact same setup here. And we will see that it will not have that problem. Of course, this is an NTSC 128. So I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna be able to get the exact same, I'm not gonna be able to replicate it in exactly the same way. There we go. That looks really good. There are some slight jail bars but basically otherwise that looks really sharp and clear and there's none of those patterns and none of that weird ghosting. There's gonna be some patterns in the camera, but this looks pretty much great. Oh, look, 30,719 bytes free, same amount. So that, that cartridge obviously is causing that particular issue. If I take the cartridge out and I hold down the Commodore key and turn it back on, let's see if we get the normal bytes free. Yeah, okay, 38,911. Anyhow, just slight jail bars is what you get on a working 128. I'm pretty sure that this computer when I got it had that ghosting and I went into my stash of parts and I was able to find another 128 uh, NTSC VIC-2 chip and put it in this computer and it fixed the problem. At first I thought it was bad contacts just like I was testing a second ago with the PAL version and switching out the VIC-2 fixed the issue. Okay, just to show everyone that I'm not crazy that I have NTSC machines with this exact problem. This is one of my NTSC boards. Uh, you can ignore this ROM situation going on. This is a kernel switcher that allows me to hold down the restore key to pick which kernel I'm gonna use. But anyhow, and I found the chip that says marginal video. This is the one that will cause the bad video quality on this NTSC machine, and it should match the bad picture quality from the PAL machine. This chip here is an 8464R6V6. And the original one here that says marginal video is an 8564R5C, Charlie, and it says AV on it. And this one, it says V6, yeah, from 1987. And this one is from 1985. Okay, here we go. Let's see if this works or looks bad. And there it is, look at that. It's very similar. Okay, not exactly the same, but the color is washed out and it has this weird ghosting pattern going on, and it looks terrible. I figured I had to prove that it's the VIC-2 chip causing this bad video quality because people are gonna tell me that I need to recap my board or whatever, which would have no effect on this particular type of issue. And sure enough, putting this one into any of my NTSC 128 causes this terrible video quality, and then just swapping out with this chip right here or another VIC-2 chip for the 128, it works great. I'll pop this marginal chip out of here and we'll put back in this one that is good. And when I turn this on now, let's see how this looks. There it is, looking good, just jail bars, but that's that's what you get. Let me turn it off and on, see if those jail bars change. Certain versions of the C64, the jail bars are slightly different on each power cycle. And there, they're a little bit reduced at this point, but otherwise looking good. On this PAL board that Alex sent me, there's really not much I can do to fix the video output. This chip here is an 8566R3, and it has a V written on it, and it's from the 43rd week of 1985. So the only thing I can assume is there is some problem in the process of these chips that causes it to degrade internally, and maybe some of the digital information is leaking through to the color information. I am not quite sure. But I'm assuming because this looks so similar to the problems with the NTSC one, the only way I can get a working good picture is to replace this VIC-2 chip with a newer one. Well, I figured now would be a good time to at least test the rest of this machine. So first let's see if the 80 columns mode works. I'll plug this keyboard in, I have to be careful because I don't wanna rest it on top of the computer now the RF shield is missing. Okay, so the 80 column switch is down. I'm gonna power this on. There we go, it's working. And actually, what I was really curious about was if this mode ran in PAL, and it definitely is, I can tell by the flicker. The digital RGB signal is like CGA, and CGA always runs at 60 hertz. So it's funny that this is running at 50, but I guess they figured that the people's monitors, like the 1084s, they were used to looking at 50 hertz, so they might as well see it here. 
It's using the same font as uh, 40 column mode, just squished because it's running 80 columns mode, but it's nice, has nice, very, very sharp color, of course, because it's running in RGB. I've switched the camera shutter speed to 50 hertz, so hopefully it flickers less, but I'm curious because on the keyboard, there's a button that says ASCII DIN, and when I push that, look at that. It changes to a, a single width character font that looks pretty cool, actually. Well, this is cool. This font thing also works in 80 columns mode. I kind of like how this single width font looks. It's kind of cool. It's just different. I'm just not used to it. Has all the same extra characters. Also does some amount of keyboard remapping. So here I'm pushing the Z or Z key repeatedly. I'm gonna push the ASCII DIN switch. I'm still pushing the same letter on the keyboard and I'm getting the Y now. And if I push what is the Y here in North America, I'm getting the Z. And if I push that and I keep pushing it, now it's typing the Y. All right, I have the diagnostic cartridge in and I have the test harness connected. I can't connect the keyboard loop back because of course uh, it doesn't fit. That's designed for a 64, so I will get an error there. But the rest of the stuff, oh, it says open. Use report bad, uh-oh. So for this bad right here, uh, might be a bad connection. So I'm gonna reapply the harness onto that connector there, see if I can make that work. So now it's even worse. Control ports are bad, user ports are bad. What, what is happening here? How could it have degraded? Every, nothing is working now. I don't know, I'm at a loss of what's going on here. This uh, definitely appears to not work. You know, I should, uh, <laughs> I should use my other 128, the NTSC one here, see if it has the same problem. Wonder if my test harness is messed up. Okay, we're back to just user port being bad. Uh, I put deoxit on the user port connector and then I put the diagnostic harness back in and that seems to have at least kind of restored things somewhat back to normal. Well, normal as in it just shows the user port. So I'm gonna switch out the single 6526 that is by the user port. I just took one off this other 128 motherboard, the NTSC one, and let me swap it in, see if that fixes the problem. If it still says a user port bad, then, then maybe there's a bad connection still. Well, it still says user port bad, so it is not the chip, it is something else that is the problem on this motherboard. So I'm running it with that entire 6526 out, the whole, the one that controls the user port, and as you see, you get a whole bunch more bad stuff, and that's because it relies on that chip working to talk to the cassette, to talk to the serial port, to, you know, this uh, second timer, for instance. So it shows both of the uh, U1 and U2 bad, those markings are for the 64, by the way. It's funny because it says cassette, okay. Keyboard, open, then control, serial port, the timers are working. Oh, it's still showing both of these chips bad. I wonder if this is something to do with the modifications to this to support this switchable character set ROM because it's probably using some signal line to do that. Yeah, we're back to just user port and both these chips being bad. I am very confused. I'm gonna plug in my other 128 motherboard just to make sure that the test harness is working correctly on the 128. All right, here's the NTSC machine. Let's let it run through the diagnostics and see if this one works. It may say the kernel is bad. That's because I have uh, Jaffe DOS in here. So ignore that. Okay, so the SID is missing, so it's bad, but it's also showing user control port open. I'm just gonna do one more sanity check and plug this harness back into a C64 and make sure it works there. All right, here is the Zip64. <laughs> I know this machine works. Oh, wow, look how much better the video output quality is on this machine than the 128s. It's brighter, has far less jail bars, and it's so sharp. Now, this one, of course, has an aftermarket RF modulator, but even with my RF modulator mod, watch that video if you haven't. I'll put a link in the description. It, the 64 video quality is superb. Yep, it's working. Keyboard is open because I forgot to plug this in. So hopefully that means there is actually no problem at all with the 128 and those errors are just due to this ROM not working well. All right, well, this is uh, Alex's German 128 board. I'm just gonna write that on here so I can keep track of that. I will write on this particular VIC chip that I'm gonna just put marginal on here. All right, time for a quick test of this uh, Competition Pro or Fake Competition Pro or Fompetition Pro. Using the ZIF64, I will go into Adrian's tools and I have a joystick test here. There it is, it's tiny, 254 bytes. What you do is just, the center dot is if you press fire, that works. Down, 
Yep. So this joystick does work. Just feels really mushy and not not great. All right. I'm very curious what's inside this brick here. I'm sure I could just look online and find that information, but I'm going to pop this bottom cover off so we can take a look inside. Yeah, that's not really meant to come apart. Okay, so it's what I thought. Look at all that potting compound in there. Oh boy. So this cable here is totally reusable. On this little board, we have just a capacitor and this is diode. So I guess that's the bridge rectifier. And we have two resistors and a small cap. And I take it that it's inside this potting compound is not only a large transformer, but there's gonna also be the voltage regulator, the, fi the five volt regulators. And you can't get to it because this is solid, solid potting compound. What a shame. I'm gonna snip the wires off from the cord that goes to the computer. Uh, it looks like there are just, uh, how many are there? There are four. I, sh I should be able to slide this out like that. And there we are. The reason why I save these cords is because um, they're, you know, original and they're not bad quality. They have thick copper wires in them, thick-ish, and they have the correct DIN plug on them for the 64. So if you're making a new power supply, this is a perfect cord. If you have one of these old bricks, just open it, cut the cord off, and then you just need a five volts power supply and a nine volt AC, and just check the pinout when you make that thing. You either 3D print a box or you just buy a box. So this is, this is actually a pretty good cord for that purpose. Oh, this is interesting. I can actually see the five volt regulator. It's right there in the potting compound, but it's soldered onto this circuit board, which would actually imply that you could put a new one on here, probably on the other side. It will actually broke it when I lifted that up the first time. You could probably put one in this box here somehow with some heat sinking. I don't know. I wouldn't recommend using a linear regulator to replace this old one, but you could do it. It just would be a bit of a bodge. And obviously the old one, you just clip the legs off of it there. So it would stay in that potting compound for eternity. Next up is the 128 power supply. Let's crack this open. Maybe there's a way to make this work here in North America. I mean, I appreciate the Commodore put these little uh, caps on the screw holes to give it a flush look, I guess. But why on earth aren't there rubber feet on the bottom of this thing so it doesn't just slide around all over your desk or all over the floor? I mean, the little rubber feet to lift it off the floor kind of would go a long way for helping. All right, well, inside of this is a giant transformer. That thing is quite hefty. And, uh, oh yeah, this, this didn't break. It just pulled through. I guess it got yanked a little too hard on the strain relief there. Well, check this out. There's some serious destruction in here. Uh, right here, this part has blown up. There's a lot of heat on the board here. So I'm curious if that's what put this C128 out of commission, that that part blew itself up there. Let's see about getting this board out of here. You can see the burn marks inside the case there where that had a, an issue, so to speak. Uh, yeah, so that is not supposed to look like that. There's a big hole blown right in this part. <laughs> okay, so clearly that part will need to be replaced if I ever have a hope to get this thing working again. But I have to wonder, will this uh, transformer have some taps on here, additional taps? for running on other voltages. That's not good. I mean, this is repairable, <laughs> but this is charred. This trace is, there's almost nothing left of it. Wow. But actually what is awesome about this is this case is perfect for putting a new power supply into. Obviously I won't be reusing any of this stuff, but I will be reusing the two cables. I just have to replace the end with the that has the European plug with the North American plug. That's easy enough. And then I'll put a five volt power supply here, switching power supply, and a nine volt AC power supply. And that would both fit in this box without issue. And that means I can have an extra power supply. Actually, that's great. Right, get, let's get one last look at this blown up component. Uh, yeah, that's uh, gonna be a problem. Your computer will not work with that going on. 
So here is the 1570 disk drive. Definitely well used. Uh, one thing I got to laugh about is clearly Commodore just painted this Alps mechanism front cover with the beige paint and it's worn off after all the use here over the years. I mean, now it has me thinking, is this painted? Or actually, now that I think about it, wasn't there a 1541 disk drive that was released for the Commodore 64C that came in this beige color? So maybe they actually changed the plastic molding to match the case color of the 64C, which also matched the 128. Actually, this drive would be older, right? This, this is probably from 1985, before the 64C. But either way, this paint thing going on here is hilarious. So the drive's in great shape, still has the original feet on it, although this foot is not looking so great. The warranty void sticker has been peeled off. So I guess that means someone's been inside this drive. Let's crack this open and take a look. I'm super curious if this is a double-sided drive or is this just another single-sided drive um, like the 1541? Like, is there any difference at all with this or is this really just a painted 1541? Well, here we go. Let's lift the cover. Oh, it's different. Well, holy bodge wires. Look at this factory bodge going on here. Three bodge wires there. Four more right here running from the hybrid over here over to um, this, which I guess is a PLA chip, has an 84 date code. So this PCB is definitely not a 1541. Now, right here, this is the head cable, and there's only one of them. So that would imply that this is definitely only a single-sided disk drive, not double-sided. And then what's curious is the large transformer under there comes up to this board here, which has the two voltage regulators on it. And this obviously is going from an AC to DC, probably 5 and 12 volts right here. And then the DC is fed into this main PCB, the digital board, through this wire over here. So there's this little four wire connector here. And then what this wire is, is this is obviously the IEC connections. It goes back to over here on this PCB where clearly there's the pin header for two IEC ports. And they just ran this uh, cable here over to this backboard where the two ports are right here. So this PCB does say 1570 here. The fact that it's got these two IEC connections here implies that maybe this was designed to go in that later 1571 disk drive chassis and they ran out of time and just had to shove it into here, I guess? Is that what happened? Well, I just happened to have a 1571 PCB right here. It's from a drive I repaired. So let's compare the two. And you know what? <laughs> it really... It really, really looks very, very similar. In fact, uh, let's see what's different. So the real 1571 has the two IEC ports installed there. It does say 1571 up here, but I gotta say, I'm not seeing very many other differences. Now, like I said, this only has a single head connected to the board, but there are actually holes on the PCB there for this dual head uh, connector here, which has twice as many pins. And maybe the only real difference is, is the ROM that's in here only supports single-sided, while the ROM in this supports double-sided, but otherwise it's very, very similar. Incidentally, I think the 6526 that's in these is not exactly the same as the ones that are in the Commodore. This says 1626A1, and so does the one on the actual 1571. I think they're missing capabilities or something that prevents these from working on a C64. So that is funny. That is so typical Commodore to design a PCB for a different disk drive and then figure out a way to slam it into this case, this old legacy case, and build this whole adapter board and run these bodge wires all over the place to kind of make it all work. And here's the front faceplate. You can definitely tell this was just painted. You can see the ma I can see the mask marks there where it's the brown color underneath, and they just they just painted it. Oh boy. All right, I'm gonna take this PCB off. I'm just curious what the disk drive looks like underneath. Seems like there's some kind of an adapter plate on there. There it is. What is this? Look at this. Look at this adapter plate. It's screwed in to the original mounting locations of the original motherboard. They designed an entire adapter plate just so they could use this PCB in this disk drive. This is 
So funny. There's probably an entire backstory to this disk drive. And, uh, you know, people probably published on the internet and I'm just not reading it, but yeah, pretty funny. There's also this sensor right here, which is different. And that's the index sensor that allows it to know where the hole is on the floppy disk as it spins. So it, it allows it to synchronize the disk. MFM format requires that, like reading PC disks, it does use that. This is definitely only a single-sided drive. There is no read-write head on the top there. So that is no different than the regular 1541. And then there's the transformer down there. So there are two extra taps. You see there's two taps there on the primary side that aren't connected to anything. So it is quite possible that it is, it's doable to get this thing running on 120 volts. Now here's a standard Alps uh, 1541 drive. Now what I think I'm gonna do is I'm going to just remove the transformer from this drive chassis entirely and hope that I can just mount it inside this one. That would be the easiest instead of fiddling around with those uh, taps. I don't wanna risk damaging this thing. And I can install the transformer right in here. Although maybe it would be kind of cool to try to rewire this one. So I wanna put out a warning, of course, that this area of this power supply is high voltage, mains voltage that is. So if you have a power cord connected and the power switch turned on, you are getting live voltages right here on this side. This side of the transformer, these uh, cables here, this is on the secondary side and this is the low voltage side, so this is safe. But this high voltage side, not safe. So just be very careful and only work on this if you know what you're doing. So I did a little investigation with the multimeter, but I also chatted with a few people from Europe who know and are familiar with these power supplies and these transformers. They told me that these extra taps are really just to convert this thing between 220 volts and 240 volts main. If you switch to 240 volts, if you're in a country where it's 240 volts, then the voltage you're gonna get out of this low voltage side is gonna be a little bit lower, which is helpful to avoid excessive heat generation on this board here that has these voltage regulators. This transformer does not support running on 120 volts. If I do put 120 volts into here, it won't cause any kind of damage, but what happens is the voltage that comes out of these lines here will be about half of what it should be, which means that this thing won't regulate properly, you won't get the right voltage rails. So what I've decided to do is take this chassis from a 1541, a North American version that has a 115 volt transformer and transplant all of the 1570 parts onto this chassis. Even though the chassis is sort of a goldish color on here and is silver on this one, they are completely interchangeable and all of the circuit boards and this adapter plate will all screw right onto this and it's the same power switch and power connector on both of these and then I'll just transfer the case over. I could just take the transformer out of here and try to transfer that over, but these wires are soldered together and it's easier for me just to switch the entire chassis. And just like that, the drive has been transferred over. I just have this board sort of sitting on here. The board is attached to the adapter plate. That way it doesn't short out to the metal chassis, but it's sitting on the drive. But the voltage regulator back here is connected and fully screwed in. I have the 115 volt transformer connected, is plugged in. So theoretically, if I plug a power cord into this and power it on, it should work or not work if there's an electronics problem. So the mains are connected. Let me power this on, watch the red light. Okay, came on, went off. Drive is not spinning anymore. That is a perfect sign. That is how this thing should be operating. I'm gonna plug the read right head in right here. The drive is currently powered off, just so you know. I'm gonna get my 64 out here and plug it in so we can do some testing. Hello, my Ziff 64. So this is the IEC cable that Alex sent along. I will use this to connect up to the disk drive. Power on the drive and power on the 64. This should light up for a second when I do that. And it does. I have the easy flash cartridge in. Let's go to Adrian's tools and we are gonna do 1541 diagnostic cart. Before I test this drive with a blank disc, I am gonna try using a cleaning floppy drive in here just to make sure that the heads are not super gunked up. So this is my Memorex cleaning floppy. I bought it off eBay. Add some alcohol. Uh, see if I try any of these things like uh, BAM, show BAM. It's gonna make it spin. It's clearly not gonna read though. All right, that should do it. These cleaning floppies do work pretty well. I have pretty good luck with them. Uh, this had a label originally on it and that came off. I think what happened when I bought this, it was new old stock. The alcohol little bottle had leaked all over this and um, it kind of warped the disc and maybe it was stored in high heat, I, I don't know. But it does work. 
that doesn't mean this works every time though. There are times when you have to really go in and manually clean the heads. All right, so the LED is flashing, but that's normal because that disc was not real. I'm gonna put a real disc in here. This one is formatted for the PC or something that is not good to go for the Commodore. But on the 1541 test, World of Janny, I'll put a link to this in the description below. You wanna do performance test. That runs through all the various testing that the drive needs, formats the disc, it head texts the heads, it does all sorts of different things. It takes a little while to run, but if that works and it passes, pretty much the drive is gonna be good to go. Of course, reading a real known good floppy disk, a C64 floppy disk in the drive and making sure that works, that's kind of necessary in the end. So I'm gonna do P for performance test. Performance test, press enter. And now it's gonna format the disk. So how this is testing, let me talk a little bit more about what the 1570 is. I did a little bit of reading since I filmed the first part of this video. Apparently Commodore came out with the 1571 disk drive with the 128. It was capable of reading both sides of the floppy disk. It supported the GCR format that Commodore used on all of earlier disk drives, plus MFM, which was used on PCs and CPM machines like that. Well, what happened is they had a shortage of double-sided drive mechanisms while they were manufacturing these drives. So what they seem to have done is taken old 1541s that are single-sided drives, painted the face here, added those extra sensors, and then they used the 1571 board in this drive to basically make a cheaper single-sided um, 1541 drive that had the 1571 capabilities. So essentially, this can only read single-sided discs, but it has all the other capabilities of the 1571, like the MFM support, the faster burst support for the C128, and the additional processing power and RAM that the 1571 has. I think the ROMs might be different to account for the fact this only has one read-write head. There may be other mods on here and people can probably comment on this in the, in the comment section. So, but that's why there are two IEC connectors here that are unpopulated because this board would be turned this way with the connectors facing the back and that's kind of how this works. Now, one thing is the 1571 actually has little dip switches on the back to allow you to select the drive ID. And this does not have that. So there must be some other components they left off. Maybe that's what some of these bodge wires are for, but clearly this thing has the capability of having that selectable drive ID. And there we go. That was all the stuff that the performance test does. And at the end it says passed. So this disc absolutely passed. The one thing you may have noticed during that performance test is you did not hear any head knocking out of this drive. And that was again, because earlier on, remember I showed there's that track zero sensor and that allows the ROMs to know when the head is all the way at the track zero position. Well, I think it's called track one on the Commodore, but that prevents it from doing that knocking sound. Something that people might find interesting is this drive mechanism, like this is one from a 1541, which is exactly the same mechanism that this is right here. This exact mechanism, except for the faceplate being different, was used in the Apple IIc as well. And when you turn on an Apple II and you hear it kind of go and makes like a knocking sound, that is exactly the same as the head knock sound on a Commodore 64. It's a different speed, so it doesn't sound quite as violent on the Apple II. It does it a lot slower. But when you first power on an Apple II, because it doesn't know where the head assembly is, it just moves it all the way to track zero. And of course, if it's on like track three, it's gonna get to the zero and then do a bunch of bumps. And that's what you'll hear that sound is. But the Apple IIc uses the same Alps mechanism as the 1541, the kind of at least with this lifting door style. They just changed the entire faceplate on the Apple. All right, let's try loading some actual software on this. So first I'm gonna reset out of there. I'll go to Jaffy DOS. So here is the floppy for Ultima 6. It's old, but I know this disc works. Load star comma eight. Let's try loading Ultima 6. This uses a built-in fast loader. So even though this drive has no Jiffy DOS, uh, I'm using a Jiffy DOS type kernel. This has a stock ROM, but this will use fast loading stuff. Oops, okay, that didn't work. Load a comma one, I think. Might be necessary. Yep, it's all loaded, there we go. Some games you gotta put the comma one so it loads it into the correct place in memory for it to auto start and work properly. Let me turn on the speaker. Oh, the audio is not even connected. There we go. That's the uh, Ultima 6 title music.
Well, that clearly loaded properly. Well, that was a little bit boring that this drive just works, but hey, I mean, that's nice. It's one thing less I don't have to fix. It was a little strange how the head read write cable here, it just kind of loops around and just flops there. Like that just doesn't seem very good, but there's not a whole lot of length. So that's pretty much the only thing it can do. Also, incidentally, I looked at another one of my 1571 boards and the dip switches to control the drive ID are right here under this blob. There are two uh, metal contacts there. So this here is the ROM and the DOS for this particular drive. And what's nice on the 1571 and consequently the 1570 is it has more RAM than the 1541s. So if you wanna upgrade this to Jiffy DOS, you just need to install an EEPROM here that has Jiffy DOS on it. And Jiffy DOS, because there's more RAM available, is able to enable and disable itself automatically. You don't have to install a toggle switch like you do on the 1541s. That means if you have a Jiffy DOS drive and you connect it to a computer that has no Jiffy DOS, it will automatically use the standard slow speed to communicate to the computer. And that's one of the reasons why I actually really like the 1571s is they're so easy to upgrade to Jiffy DOS and then you don't have to drill any holes in the case to do it. Well, I gotta say everything is working really well. The disk drive's fully reassembled. I use 303 aerospace protectant on it to kind of rejuvenate the plastic. I give it a little bit of a clean first. Then I use this. This has definitely returned some of the shiny luster back to the disk drive. And the same goes for this Commodore 64. This is the one Alex sent me. I gave it a kind of a good cleaning, not a, not a deep, deep clean, but a good surface cleaning. And I also used the 303 protectant on it. It was really dull, the plastic originally. And now it actually has a little bit of a shine back to it. It's still not as lusterful, is that a word, lusterful? Lusterful as it probably should be, but it still looks a whole lot better. I use a little bit of magic eraser to get the old scuff off. There's still a few little marks here and there because of course it's not brand new, right? Also, if you watched 8-Bit Show and Tell's recent video on his Commodore 64 where he got uh, donated some stuff, he mentioned one of the 64s he got had a different color top and bottom. Well, that's actually happened quite a few times for me where I've gotten different color tops and bottoms like the plastic is just different and the top has yellowed in a different way than the bottom. This bottom one looks a lot closer to the original C64 color, in my opinion, than this top. It was also a whole lot less oxidized than the bottom. I really believe that this machine is whole in exactly the same way it was when it was brand new. And it's just been over time that it's yellowed this way and got oxidized. But like this 303 protectant always does, it made it look a whole lot better. I think it could probably use a couple more coats of it to really bring a bit more of the shine back, but it is amazing what this stuff does. It, it helped up the keyboard as well. Using this PAL machine, I've booted up a bunch of games that don't work well on NTSC machines like Turrican 2, and I had a great fun time playing those. And of course, I've been looking at some PAL demos, which basically none of them work properly on NTSC machines. But of course, they're designed for PAL machines, so they look perfect on this. I've pretty much decided that I'm gonna leave this painted faceplate as is with this original wear, because this thing was used, it was loved, and this is what happens when you use and love a painted disk drive. It just doesn't look perfect anymore. So I kind of like the look of this, and I'm just gonna leave it. I almost forgot to show off the disk notcher that Alex sent along. So floppy disks need to have a notch cut in them for you to be able to write to them. So if you wanted to prevent writing to this disk, you could put a little sticker over this or a piece of tape, and that would tell the disk drive that the disk is write protected. Well, if you wanna use the back side of this disk in a single-sided disk drive, and then on the Commodore drives, you could flip it over. But the problem is, is there's no notch cut there, so you can't write to it. Now these disks are actually designed to be double-sided disks, but in a regular, say, PC disk drive, or even in a Commodore 1571, you stick it in like this, and there are two read-write heads, one on each side, so it writes to both sides. But on a standard 1541, or like an Apple II disk drive, or even this 1570 here, it can only write to one side at a time. That means that if you want to maximize the space on your disk, you would want to write to the back side as well, otherwise you're basically wasting that whole side of the disk in a Commodore. So these things were invented because a lot of people were sitting there trying to cut this other notch. You basically need to put a notch on this side of the disc so when you flip it over, it's in the same position as this one. Well, people would use scissors and a knife or even a hole punch, and that absolutely worked fine, but it was sort of crude. 
So companies started manufacturing these things, which weren't that expensive. And then basically you could notch your disc. So you just took your disc like, and you stuck it in like that. You would basically line it up all the way there. And then you just push down like that. And now we have a RiperTech notch on both sides. And you get a little bit of an off cut there. When I was a kid with my Apple IIc, I absolutely notched all of my discs. I had a red one of these, or sort of an orangey color. And yep, all of my discs were notched so I could have stuff on both sides to maximize my discs. They were expensive back then, you have to remember. And of course, notching this doesn't have any effect if you want to use this particular floppy disk again in a double-sided disk drive. It just, it only looks at the one on the one side, uh, not the one I just cut. But, you know, flipping it over, it does the trick. There is one thing to consider though. This hole right here, this is the index hole and MFM disk drives. So like ones using the PC and also this disk drive when it's being used in CPM mode, it needs this index hole so it can tell where the disk is as it's rotating. And if you flip this over, well, clearly there's no hole there. So I think there existed um, different uh, hole punches that would punch this out, or maybe you did it yourself by lifting this up, or I don't know, there were, there were tricks around this too. But you can't flip a, a single-sided disc over in a single-sided PC floppy drive. It will not work because of that. So that's just a small tidbit. These are really for single-sided disc drives on the Apple II and the Commodore 64 like these. So with that, I want to say thank you to Alex for sending me this stuff all the way from Germany. That was absolutely so generous of you. Really appreciate it. Oh, and by the way, the Harry Bow gummy bears, they're gone. They didn't even last the filming of this video. So the 64 just needed a new PLA. This disk drive worked perfectly, other than of course needing a new transformer. And the C128 absolutely worked perfectly, except for that VIC-2 chip that's dying. Really unfortunate but otherwise in great condition. And I do have some power supply parts here for making some new switch mode power supplies to replace the old, uh, not so good linear ones. And of course, even a, even a joystick here that Alex sent. Oh, and a box for the 128 as well, which I'm gonna use. Um, I don't have the original foam anymore, but I will take the 128 um, and wrap it up in some packing material and put that back in this box. So at least the German 128 can be stored in the German 128 box. So I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, I'd appreciate a thumbs up. But if you didn't, you know what to do. You can hit that thumbs down button. Uh, hit that subscribe button if you want to subscribe to my channel and the little bell icon if you want to be notified when I upload new videos. And then put your comments and your suggestions down in the comment section below. I'd love to hear from you. And that's going to be it. Stay healthy, stay safe, and I'll see you next time. Goodbye.